Welcome to episode four, where we're going to have a look at that word, envy. It's a four-letter word and a difficult one. Uh, I apologise in advance. I'm in my bedroom. The windows are open, just because there's a nice breeze. So we will get to hear some lovely birds in the background, but we might get to hear some cars and motorbikes as well. So please forgive me in advance for that. Now, a lot of people ask me, you know, it, with emotional fitness at home, we're looking at especially in this COVID-19 time, the necessity to do some emotional assessment. And many people, clients have said to me, and, and God, I have to admit this for myself, that they're surprised that they're so overwhelmed. And I've had to reassure them that this is a, you know, trying to apply normal constructs in an abnormal environment sets you up for disappointment because there's nothing about this COVID-19 time and there's nothing about um, having to change the dynamic of autonomy we have, autonomy we have in, in just being able to go and do and see people as we would have. So what this does is present new challenges for people and it's like working a new emotional muscle. We have never done this before. So often we don't know we're in overwhelm or we're in you know, exasperation or exhaustion emotionally, physically, mentally until we're there. We don't know where the new boundaries are because we haven't done this before. Now, should, let's say, the restrictions ease and then we've got to go back into lockdown in two or three months time, God forbid we don't, but let's say that happened. Many of us would be better equipped to go, okay, this time let's do A, B and C, let's not do D, E and F, because that didn't work. Because we will have a, we'll have a reference point on what to do and what not to do and what works and what doesn't. And especially for introverts and extroverts in the home, you know, introverts uh, can get peopled out and extroverts can get cabin fever. And then you've got the ambiverts, the people that kind of sit in the middle, they need a bit of solitude, they need a bit of connection. Um, so there's no one size fits all and we're all been given this new assignment and some of us are doing better than others. Now I've had some really good days and I've had some shit days. Um, I had a shit day yesterday, I was a mean bitch yesterday, which comes so naturally for me <laughs> as a recovering addict in recovery. Um, and a female that has found men extremely challenging having grown up with two predatory males in my midst as a little girl. Partnering with males has been something I've run from most of my adult life and not actually believed I could do or they would do. I've been with my husband for the past 16 years and um, we have a, you know, like most couples, you know, you're together because the dance works, but in isolation, him having to work from home, he's more extroverted than me. He's big energy in my home. I work from home. I'm used to it being very quiet upstairs. And just yesterday, um, I cooked us a roast chicken lunch and um, he'd been to Bunnings. He's building something for me. He's, you know, he's an engineer and he builds, you know, if I can say to him, I need some shelves in the kitchen, he'll do them and he's very sweet that way. Come back from Bunnings and then I, I called him upstairs for lunch and I knew he hadn't washed his hands. He'd been at Bunnings and he started to carve the chicken and I just lost my shit. Now, I must say, probably for the last three weeks of us working at home together, I haven't lost my shit in that way. So that's a pretty good track record for me. But nonetheless, I was unrealistic and I was unkind. And, you know, and he, God love him, he said, you know, but I wash my, he needed to wash his hands earlier that day, but, you know, not before he carved the chicken. Anyway, these are things that are presenting themselves and I'm sure we've all got stories like that. What's that got to do with envy and jealousy? Well, nothing, I'm just gonna to get to that in a moment. But what I suppose I'm saying here is that we are all uh, being given a new depth of emotional assignment, physical assignment, intellectual assignment, spatially. And for, for introverts and extroverts, it's, it's different, different requirements. Um, and yes, just reminding ourselves and others that this is an abnormal environment that requires abnormal energy expenditure, emotionally, physically, sexually, financially, and we are all on our trainer wheels. So none of us have mastered this yet. And so being patient and kind to ourselves is easier said than done. 
Now I promise that if you've watched episode three, I started to tell you a story about jealousy. Um, but before I get to that, today's um, topic is envy. And many people have said to me, what's the difference between envy and jealousy? And I've heard a few descriptors. I remember one told to me by beautiful sister Anne, you might have heard me talk about this lovely nun I met in my early days of recovery, clean and sober, sitting in recovery groups with a nun that had hit the piss and was an alcoholic and this amazing woman full of so much grace and wisdom, but a nun nonetheless, she was getting, getting pissed and drunk um, in the nunnery and so she was just a contradiction but a delight. Anyway, I remember her explaining it to me, the difference between envy and jealousy, probably 20 odd years ago, 20, I've been clean and sober. If I get to October the 12th this year, it'll be quarter of a century, 25 years. So it must have been 24 years ago. There was so much I didn't understand about the subtleties of emotions. And you know, if you think about the seven deadly sins, they are just common themes that all human beings tend to get stuck on. And you know, what do we have to let go of and what do we have to hold on to? We have to let go of fear and hold on to love. And when we get in a state of envy or a deeper state, which we call jealousy, in that state, we need to let go of our fears and hold on to love, empathy, kindness and compassion. Easier said than done, because some emotions are quite unattractive. So she said, told me this story and she said, if you, you know, envy is when, and it can be used as a form of um, inspiration, but, it, you know, and in that portal, envy used as an accelerator, you know, is... Um, for example, if, if you know a football team is watching a rerun of a game that they lost, you know they could, you know the winners could be in an enviable position because they won, and that's what the losing team wanted. Anyway, Sister Anne told me this story. She said, if you think of two little toddlers, you've got a little two-year-old girl who's just walking, and she's got a four-year-old brother, and she watches every day her little brother open the door and go out and play and she's not allowed to go out and play without asking mummy and daddy and she can't reach the door handle and she watches and she watches and she goes along and she stands on her tippy toes and till eventually she works out how to pull you know something to stand on close to the door and open the door now she envies her brother being able to go out there and do that so that accelerates her trying to get innovative and creative and so our competitors so envy is when we covet when we want when we crave, desire, something somebody else is doing or having. And if we see it for what it is without getting fearful and we try and better ourselves, you know, that can be um, something that can be constructive. However, if we get fearful about it, envy can disintegrate into the state of jealousy. And jealousy is that deeper state where we actually believe that them having what they have is going to take something from us. So envy is coveting and wanting what somebody else has in its purest form. But jealousy takes it a state deeper and jealousy is the fear of losing something you value because that person is there. They are going to take away from you because they have that. Um, and then starting to live in a state of insecurity and obsessing about that. And also to making yourself less worthy. So when we get very fearful about envy and it, it starts to snowball, it moves into a state of jealousy. And, um, and I started to, to talk, and that, that chakra is in the heart. And we, we talk about the green-eyed monster. And it's very interesting that heart chakra uh, is, a, is a green chakra, a beautiful green chakra. And when it's evolved, it has shades of pink. So when we are in a place that is the opposite of envy and jealousy, we understand our worth and everybody else's. So when I meditate on that heart chakra in the mornings, I close my eyes and imagine beautiful green light flushing through my heart. So anything I was carrying from yesterday where I might have felt competitive or envious or just dishonored myself in some ways or I was unkind to myself, I meditate on that space, flushing it through with green and then that morphs into a beautiful pink. And I start the day with that clean, that chakra. Um, it's like clearing out a glutter, gutter, clearing out an energy center. Now, 
we often hear about you know this be kind movement um, and people talk about being kind and I have so many clients that are kind-hearted people that are generous people that are doaholics and helpaholics but if you listen to their language towards themselves they are anything but kind being kind only to the outward world is not sustainable you'll end up getting resentful and you'll end up um, emotionally malnourished because you can't give away what you haven't got if you want to keep being kind and giving kindness you've got to fill up your heart's tank and so many people dishonor themselves to honor other people and when you say the difference between helping and rescuing and some people get um, there's a beautiful natural high from helping somebody but if you do it without boundaries you're in danger of draining your own life giving away what they call your seed corn you know people that are very kind and charity minded but they do it in order to in some ways be self-righteous help other people but not take the time to be emotionally present for those people they love at home their lover their partner their children they're so busy giving to the external world that they take away from their seed corn they take away from their you know they come home emotionally exhausted with nothing to give those they love now in my very first uh, days of working with emotional fitness I ran a drop-in center we were federally funded I had a huge drop-in center that worked six days a week which suited me because at that time my boys on every other weekend would go to their dads but it wasn't sustainable because I began to emotionally burn out and became a helper you know a helperholic you know helping other people but you know not giving to myself and um, being exhausted when I did have my boys with me so I had to pair that back so this heart chakra needs to be um, rebooted with thoughts of self-honor and being kind to ourselves because when we're doing that that dissolves away feelings of envy and jealousy when we know that we are enough we honor our individuated self we are enough as we are we are not supposed to be uh, replicas of anybody else when we see people that are in our arena that we envy if we don't get into jealousy we just we can see them as people that can inspire us but we don't judge ourselves as less you know we use them for inspiration we thank them for their achievements and their innovation and their creativity because it's awakened that in ourselves we get jealous when we believe that there's not enough to go around and we don't have a what it takes and we make ourselves you know worse we become insecure about our own value and I mentioned um, in episode 3 I had been a woman that had been fairly disconnected from partnership so I always chose men that were far more into me than them and so I felt in a very dysfunctional way that I had more power I always chose someone that was a little bit more emotionally fucked up than me and I also chose other other partners where I could see that there was an exit strategy so I could leave when I needed to when they required me to be too present or when I got bored or whatever the reason was now it wasn't until I got clean and sober back in 1995 and I got into recovery and I spent some time in single years just rebooting my marriage with myself and it wasn't until I was a partner to myself, so my marriage to myself, my logical self, my masculine self, my external world actually partnering with my emotional self, my feminine self, my empathy, my, you know, my right hand side of the brain working as partners. Being in a state, you know, and you hear people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates talk about the fact that they are a lot more constructive in the world when they are informed by their intuition their gut instinct their emotional world they are sensitive as well as productive so I had to work on repartnering my relationship with myself and had to do a lot of work around that heart chakra um, I won a writing competition back in 1991 and I was studying the chakras then I was doing you know crystal courses and chakra massages and um, I'd been clean and sober for a little while because my youngest son uh, was uh, he was only born in 1988 so I'd been breastfeeding and I hadn't been drinking and drugging and I had been writing and trying to you know um, I always found that when I didn't drink and drug I, I just wrote and, and was doing some internal research 
Anyway, there was a competition being run by Greenpeace. And back in the day then, in the early 1990s, we had Elle McPherson on television um, explaining to us how to recycle you know, our coffee grinds and how to, how to set up different recycling bins, because recycling bins weren't a thing then. We only had one bin. So I was setting up my five bins and we saw footage and I remember being devastated because I've always had, since I was a little girl, an intimate relationship, my heart has always had an intimate relationship with trees and I was meditating under trees as a little girl after the trauma and the violence. I'd go and lay in my avatar pod under the tree, twirl, my gra twirl the grass between my fingers, imagining that Mother Earth was underneath me and Father Time was above me in the sky, but the lemon tree was like a church and trees have always been <sighs> beautiful churches for me. They've always offered great comfort and shelter. Anyway, um, when I saw the Amazon jungle being butchered and I'd done a lot of research around, you know, the guy, the whole concept that Mother Earth is a living entity. And um, I found it really interesting in some of the things I'd read that from an aerial view, the Amazon jungle was the shape of a heart. And so Triple M uh, were running a uh, writing competition and you had to write about why green why Earth Pete, Earthwatch and um, uh, Greenpeace, you know, should consider taking you on a trek to the Amazon. Anyway, my heart was pounding and I had all of this visual imagery of me walking through the Amazon, you know, with my husband, the father of my children, had long blonde corkscrew hair and I just was starting to see him and I walking through. Anyway, I scrawled out probably a four page letter. It was like taking dictation. I just poured it onto the page and the whole basis of my request to be taken was that, you know, Mother Earth, you know, we were butchering Mother Earth's heart and it was just a representation of our internal relationship with our own heart. And, you know, I was writing about what I knew best, you know, drugs and alcohol had been hijacking and butchering my relationship with my own heart and was only in the first couple of years of motherhood of my second son where I could see that. Anyway, poured my heart onto the page. Two weeks later, out of 12,000 entries nationally, I won and I got to trek the Amazon jungles in Peru with scientists from the Smithsonian Institute. And I was, I had this weird time warp moment when we were at these black lakes where there's black piranha and in this really sacred part of the Amazon that um, scientists hadn't been to before. We discovered 12 species of catadids which had never been dis discovered in the, in the canopies before and we were at this really, we had to sign indemnity clauses because if we were bitten by any fertile ants or, or bushmaster snakes, we were eight hours from Iquitos up the Amazon, we weren't going to get back. And so we had to sign these indemnity clauses and I had these two young sons, you know, two and four years of age, so it was a big trip. But there was a moment when we were walking towards a black lake and I looked at my husband's back and his blonde corkscrew hair, remembering I had seen that vision before I wrote the entry. Anyway, a very weird time. But nonetheless, I had a very strong spiritual experience standing on the edge of the Amazon. It's a very feminine, it feels like a feminine body of water. And I remember standing on the edge of the Amazon and there is, because it's such a wide and a huge body of water, there are, it's, it sort of rushes almost like the sea and there are some places where you stand it so wide you can't see the other side and I was standing there and this amazing storm came and I stood there in the rain and these black clouds kind of rolled through the sky and then were followed by this pink sunset and it was a very very strong time for me where I realized that my marriage was in trouble and I needed to start to honor my heart and speak my truth so that pink and green I saw a pink dolphin I had an experience, it was a spiritual experience with a pink dolphin in the Amazon as we were on this canoe. So much glory and wonder. It was a very pivotal spiritual time in my life. So this is a beautiful heart chakra. And it was when I really started to, to wake up, you know, um, the delight in seeing a pink dolphin really awoken me from a very deep sleep. And to be delighted is to be awakened. And this is what the heart chakra is all about. Anyway, Fast forward that the, the marriage to the father of my children did end, but he's still a beautiful soul and still in my life today. But when I started dating the man I'm with now, and I'd been with him for, I've been with him now for 16 years, but it was a very new experience to, I was falling in love with him and I couldn't, 
literally falling you know I don't know if you've ever had a dream where you fall and you wake up and you're jolted I kept trying to jolt myself out of this surrendered state that my femininity I was just drawn to him his scent you know I hadn't lost my emotional virginity before I was falling in love and I couldn't kind of stop myself in the past because I you know I didn't have any drugs and alcohol in my system and I did have established with myself albeit on my trainer wheels a partnership with my emotional uh, internal emotional world with all the work I'd done on my chakras and meditation and in, in therapy and also my intellectual world so I'd written my first book and it'd become a top 10 bestseller and I was working on my second book and um, that it was just coming out as I was dating um, this man I call him Mr. Delicious and I, t I call him that because the first time he kissed me honestly I was 42 years of age and it was the first time my heart felt a kiss it was like all the fairy lights inside of me just turned on for the first time this electrical current run through me and I was finally connected and it made me feel vulnerable my emotional world being fired up I was having big feelings that I couldn't my intellect could not control and I had no drugs or alcohol or no substances to numb them off so I was really falling for this man and it was such a first for me and we were on a holiday in um, South Australia in Harndorf and I have German heritage my um, great great grandmother was one of the very first f four families that came to the Barossa Valley and helped founded the Barossa Valley so on that German side and I lived um, up around Harndorf for the very first uh, 13 years of my life and so we were on a holiday revisiting that place and in this beautiful German uh, town of Harndorf and I was with him you know we were we were young lovers well not young but we were uh, courting and I was really falling for him and <coughs> we were wandering in and out of shops so many beautiful shops there and he's an engineer but he loves woodworking and he'd wandered into a shop and I was somewhere else and I'd seen him go into that shop and I followed him, him in a few minutes later and as I walked in I could it's a very cluttered shop full of woodcraft beautiful beautiful shop you know the beautiful cuckoo clocks and just wonderful wonderful beautiful things and I could see him standing down the front of the shop talking to the shop assistant and I just tinkered around and had a look around and then I could see through the aisles they hadn't sort of seen me come in um, this beautiful woman I mean exquisite kind of a Sophia Loren goddess of a woman um, flicking her hair back and she was flirting with him and she was showing him this beautiful piece of wood a wooden box or something and he was really engaged and asking her all about the wood and I could see he was quite oblivious but she was flirting with him and she was probably my age but a woman of great beauty magnificent breathtaking and I stood there and all of a sudden I felt I felt this feeling and it and it made me incredibly uncomfortable and I felt it in my heart anyway I must have knocked something and made a noise and and he turned around and heard me and he said oh sweetheart come and have a look at this beautiful I think it was walnut wood come and have a look at this and this woman all of a sudden um, as soon the moment he called me sweetheart she kind of changed her demeanor and I just turned around and I said oh, no I'll, I'll catch you later I just walked out I scurried out like a little church mouse really overwhelmed the adrenaline and not really knowing being fully fully feeling this feeling of and it was jealousy it would move past envy I mean of course I would love to look like that woman but this feeling of jealousy that she could take him from me this insecurity and um, anyway he came out and he said he said you scurried out are you all right and I just had this big feeling and what I'd learned about big feelings is to own them not shame them um, not project them onto anybody else nor shame myself for having them but to, to just talk my through to articulate to talk about what's going on in my heart and I stood there and I was embarrassed all my throat was red and he said sweetheart what is it and I said to, I had to confess I said I think I just got really jealous I got so awkward my heart the adrenaline and I just she was so beautiful and she was flirting with you and he looked at me and he said aren't you gorgeous and he held both my hands and he looked deeply at me and he said yes she was an attractive woman but you my darling you have my heart and I'm kind of chuffed that you you got jealous but nobody could take 
you from me and it's exactly what I needed to hear and then I cried and he gave me this beautiful hug and we stood there in this German village of Handorf and he just honored my jealousy um, I was able to honor it and he honored it and that was a real first for me years later my uh, youngest son had uh, we we'd gone from being quite affluent and financially comfortable and when I got clean and sober that affluence you know I became a single mother on the pension and uh, we weren't you know I was not able to give the boys the luxuries I used to the big birthday parties and the extravagance and God knows I wasted a lot of money anyway my youngest son had been to a birthday party of a very affluent one of the friends that he knew and he came home and he wasn't talking to me and um, I went to sit with him at bedtime and I said what's up you know you seem like you're cross with mummy anyway he started to talk to me about that he was ang angry you know and and he started to talk about not being able to have the toys that this boy got in this big party and us not living with the his, uh, his dad anymore and he just you know he started to you know talk about his feelings and I said sweetheart that sounds like you're just got a little bit jealous and he looked at me and I said look mummy's gotten jealous before people get jealous and you know uh, and we spoke through it and he looked at me you know he was just a young lad but he looked at me and I explained that everybody gets jealous and then I mentioned one of his friends that was a little younger that um, his mum had left him and he was living with his dad and this little boy scurried to come over our house whenever he could because you know and you know I would sit with both of them one under each arm and read to him because I knew he missed his mum and he missed that maternal and we spoke about his dear friend and I said you know I think he might get jealous of you sometimes and we spoke about that and we took the sting out of it turned all the lights on and he gave me a big hug and he reconnected but I was able to help him understand his jealousy own his jealousy and not shame him for it and that we cleared that blockage in the heart now remembering jealousy is when envy snowballs and goes from being something that inspires us that we covet to obsess about and we get fearful about and if that keeps going it'll move us into a deeper state of jealousy where we really believe that um, we start to compare ourselves with this other personal situation and believe there's not enough love to go around for us. If we work on clearing our heart chakras in the morning, there is always enough love to go around because we, sh we charge up our heart's battery. So many people do mindfulness and they do cognitive therapy and they do intellectual reading and they, they do a lot of intellectual study, but the longest journey is from the head to the heart. We need to surrender to our heart and invest in giving it some quality time on a daily basis. That's what meditation is. Surrendering to the divine feminine, to being sensitive to the fact that we all have feelings, we all get blocked. And there are, you know, if we work, do an emotional work in, as well as our physical workouts, if we do work ins on a daily basis, none of this builds and snowballs and it doesn't become a blocked state. So, a bit to think about there with jealousy and envy in your life. And if you find that you ever are jealous, the most important thing to do is to hold your own hand, hold your own heart, and feel the feeling. It will pass if you honour it. Remembering you can't give away what you haven't got. When you squeeze an orange, orange juice comes out. When you're under pressure, if your heart's low on fuel, and, and if you're low on self-love, you're going to resort to self-abandonment when you're under pressure and not believe in yourself and not be able to back yourself. And it's one thing to intellectually back yourself, but to emotionally back yourself. When you don't win a competition, when somebody, you know, uh, a competitor has a win that you wanted to have, when it's your turn to sit on the bench and take a back seat. If you can back yourself, and remind yourself that you're lovable whether you know um, your first second third or in the audience you know that you have your own worth um, you can live from a more peaceful place so uh, envy jealousy are a part of the human rainbow of emotion to flush them through and meditate and surrender and when you do have those, when you see those big feelings arise, because competition is not the problem. We need to observe our competitors. Jealousy only occurs when we start to judge 
them or us as better or worse. And jealousy is usually a byproduct of judging them as better and because they're better they're going to take from us because you know uh, what we have is replaceable. Now anybody that's had a you know gone through the bushfires or had um, you know I had a, I suffered a bankruptcy in, in, back in um, 2006 because of you know backing a man financially and signing documents that I didn't think about and blindly blindly trusting him and the thing is um, but I you know I was able to pay that all back and and have that reversed in a very short period of time and rebuild my life but um, you know when those harsh times happen and and you lose the external things that are replaceable, it's time to dig deep and draw on, you know, and I had to do a lot of meditation and a lot of backing myself and a lot of, you know, picking up glasses at the convention center and working in flower shops and just rebuilding myself financially. But I was, with the help of therapy and for me, a higher power, and my higher power is beautiful mother nature and father time. They are um, a source of consistent comfort for me, the trees, the, sky, the stars, the sky, the ground, the earth. I never wake up any morning and wonder, will Mother Nature and Father Time give me enough oxygen to breathe today? Will the sun go up and down? Um, I, I never wonder about that because I've never been let down by that. So that's for me is a higher power. And um, I meditate to that and give thanks to that on a daily basis and it helps keep me anchored and emotionally fueled up. We've got to look after our heart. We've got to look after our emotional fitness and our emotional energy, especially at times like this. Abnormal times like this when, you know, we are in uncharted territory. So I hope that there's been a little bit of food for thought there for you on that word envy and jealousy. And I hope that the sting of shame and blame has, um, I hope I've been able to help you dissolve that away uh, this, it's a seven deadly sin for a reason that it's a common place for human beings to fall into envy and if they don't let go of the fear it will uh, disintegrate into jealousy and that's really quite immobilizing but with an open-hearted person that cares about us we can climb back out of that deep well of jealousy and in the absence of an open-hearted person like my husband who hugged me outside of the shop in Harndorf or me being able to open my heart to my son who was jealous of his friend's birthday party. In the absence of another being present to open our heart to a divine spirit of love, beauty and hope. God for me is an acronym, G-O-D, Great Outdoors. Mother Nature and Father Time will never let you down. If you're in overwhelm and there's nobody around, go and lay your body down in powered surrender under the stars, under the clouds, on the lawn in the backyard. And breathe. That is a meditative space. You can't get that wrong. Just breathe and if you've got some beautiful music, put your ear pods in and let whoever you love to sing, sing to you. And be still your beating heart. You can, you can heal and recover and reboot. It's like shutting down a computer. Sometimes we just get frozen in big feelings. If you just unplug the external world and plug in the internal world, your heart will reboot and charge up. Okay, episode five we are going to do on gluttony. And uh, as a recovering drug addict, alcoholic, oh my God, have I gotten sugar drunk and gluttonous? Absolutely. Certainly, my halo certainly has not arrived in the mail. So I will share some lived experience uh, on gluttony and helping you clear out that, that chakra and solar plexus. Sending you lots of love. Thank you for listening and for tuning in. If you haven't subscribed, please hit the subscribe button and feel free to share away if you feel that um, emotional fitness at home might be helpful for anybody that you care about. Mwah. Lots of love. See you soon, hopefully.